Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Ben Holt. I'm uh, currently the Bristol Law Society President. Um, I'm also a litigation partner at BWV, um, and we're um, certainly aware of uh, uh, clients increasing interest in more innovative funding options. Um, we see a move away from hourly rates as supposedly been high on the agenda and pretty much ever since I started practicing um, a long time ago but over the past few years I've certainly felt it's picking up momentum um, and I've found myself calling Mark and David at an ECTO to discuss the options um, increasingly often over the past year or two. Um, just so everyone's aware this webinar is being uh, recorded um, and it'll be available on our um, YouTube channel afterwards if anyone wants to catch up on it. Um, there'll be options for Q&A's at the end of the session. If I can, please ask you to um, put your Q&A's into the, uh, the uh, Q&A uh, function. That'd be awesome. Otherwise, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to um, make up a load of questions myself. So please do help me out on that front. Um, the next session we've got coming up um, next Wednesday is uh, Landlord and Tenant Managing Insolvency Risks with uh, Philip Courier Forum Chambers. Um, so if it's of interest to you, if not, if you can let your colleagues know, that'd be great. <coughs> um, so today's um, guest speaker um, is uh, Mark Beaumont, who's um, from Anecto Legal Limited. Um, they um, assist with um, innovative use of retainers, funding, um, accident insurance, um, legal expenses um, and, and third party funding um, and he's going to be giving us some updates um, on uh, how you can um, create an edge in a competitive market. Um, obviously um, given that Nectar are one of BLS's key partners um, I have to say something nice about them um, but genuinely um, I've known Mark um, and David for um, several years now um, and the top blokes um, and always happy to have a chat and something I found really helpful um, is just to get that sort of fag packet idea of what it's likely, um, you know, are, are funders likely to be interested in this case? What is their cut likely to want to be? Just to get a really rough and ready idea, because I'm quite conscious that the cost of sort of preparing the formal opinions and filling in um, the necessary forms and going through the process can in itself be reasonably expensive and time consuming um, to do from, from the client's end. So just having that initial chat to work out, is it worth doing that? Um, I found I found that they're um, really helpful and happy to have that chat um, and I think they're just speaking to Mark before we uh, went live with this it's, it's something that he's keen to encourage people to do so um, there's no you know no no commitment just you can pick up the phone and um, ask them to just talk through the scenario um, so without further ado I'll um, hand over to uh, Mark um, to give us the talk um, but please do remember to um, type in questions as we go and I'll pick them up at the end and ask them through thank you Mark thank you Ben um, yeah, so talking about growing a dispute resolution practice, um, obviously with a particular focus on retainers, funding and insurance. So we'll talk about different options basically for, for how you can go about growth. Um, what are the things that's stopping um, potentially clients instructing you? Different types of products available in the market, how you can access them, and then when to actually consider those options as well. Uh, and then obviously there'll be any questions at the end. I just want to talk briefly about something that I think perhaps isn't talked about enough in the market, and that's the actual impact of litigation on clients. So I'm just going to very briefly um, talk about accounts. So apologies in advance for that. I know it's not the most exciting subject, hopefully aided by the fact there are some pretty colours on these graphs for you. So just to use an example here, we've got a, a claim. Um, I've not used any particular numbers here because I'm conscious of the fact that there'll be people listening to this presentation who specialise in claims of, you know, 100, 200,000 pounds and the be other people on here that are perhaps doing claims of 50, 100 million pounds. Um, it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. So I've, I've kept it just broad and generic here. So these could be units of whatever you want them to be. It's the interaction between the costs and the damages is the most important thing rather than the absolute numbers themselves. So we've got a claim here expressed as the green bar. Uh, it's a claim of 50, uh, 50 whatever. Um, and we've estimated costs have been two for the claimant expressed in the gray bar. And our overall risk, therefore, are our own costs of two and potential adverse cost risk of another two, which is expressed in the red bar um, as four. Mark, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Mark. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's everyone else. The bar isn't showing on my screen at the moment. I've just got you at the moment. Interesting. 
So that was our 15 minutes of technical prep, Ben, out, out of the window. Ah, it's, it must just be me, because all the people in the Q&A are saying that they can see them for the rest of us, so it's just, uh, excellent it's just me being incompetent. I don't know what my face was doing there, but inside there was just sheer panic at that moment in time because I've already <laughs> got screen sharing on and I've no idea what, what to do other than that. <laughs> so we've got um, uh, the green bar, a claim of 50, and we've got our own costs expressed in the gray bar, and then the red bar is, is overall risk. So our costs plus potential adverse costs. And we're just gonna look at what that means for a, for a business. So from an accounting perspective, you treat your claim as a contingent asset. Um, but obviously you can't treat the costs as being contingent, they're very real. Um, you're spending that money, that's going to impact on your profitability as a business. It's the only thing it can impact on, it's not increasing sales or anything else. Um, and we've also got to carry a contingent liability for the adverse costs. So we've got a contingent asset, a contingent liability for adverse costs, and then real hard costs going on our bottom line um, for, for our legal costs. This is looking underneath that same graph we've just looked at, and it's the impact that those costs and, and assets have on our actual balance sheet. So if we're accounting using EBITDA, and there's an explainer at the bottom there of what EBITDA is for those that are, are interested, but it's a typical way of looking at businesses and how you might value a business. And often there'll be a, a multiplier of, could be anything from two to 20, depending on the industry, uh, but a multiplier on profits, that gives you a valuation for that company, which is obviously important if you want to buy other companies, if you want to sell your own company, if you want to borrow money, pay dividends, whatever you want, might want to do. So all we're doing here is adding an example multiplier of times five in this instance to those costs and, and contingent risk. And we see that now our two costs are actually minus 10 in terms of the accounting impact. Um, and our actual overall risk is, is obviously much higher than that, it's minus 20 shown there as the, the descending red bar, which hopefully even Ben can see. Um, does winning help? Well, not really is the answer because from an accounting perspective, even if you're successful in litigation, it doesn't undo the ongoing damage you've done for the last year, 18 months, two years of, of litigating, where you've had to carry that contingent risk on your balance sheet. And you've also had those real costs impacting on your accounts during that time as well. And those costs are dealt with um, on an accounting basis as, as real hard costs that are impacting on your profits, as I mentioned before. Unfortunately, when you're successful in litigation, any, any recoveries and any damages that are recovered at that point in time are not dealt with in the same way. They're dealt with as an exceptional item, a one-off instance in your accounts. So you've got this kind of degradation of your profits over a long period of time, and then just this one-off exceptional item going into your accounts, which ultimately, in summary, just means that the damage has already been done at that point, and success in litigation doesn't undo that damage. It, anyone coming and looking at your accounts as a business will just see that your profits have not been as good as they thought they would be over the last few years because of all the money you've been spending on legal fees. And that's rather unfortunate. So is there a way that we can, we can deal with this? Well, a lot of the things we're talking about today is gonna to be about how do we move risk around? And this isn't about law firms taking on huge amounts of risk for their clients, because that's obviously has the same consequences for a, for a legal practice in terms of the risk they're taking and that the impact on their own accounts and tax position and everything else. What we're talking about is risk that's currently sits with clients in terms of costs and adverse costs, and seeing where we can move those and what the consequences of doing so are. So here we see, you know, what we've done is we've shifted all of the risk off the client's balance sheet. So they're no longer having to spend their own money on their legal costs and they're not carrying that contingent risk for adverse costs anymore. Those sharp eyed among you may have noticed that the green bar is no longer as tall as it was previously. And that's because we've had to write down that contingent asset by an amount to reflect the fact that somebody else is now taking that risk on our behalf and no doubt is going to want to share in that asset should it be successfully released upon the conclusion of the litigation. And what I mean by that is if you win, you're going to recover damages, costs, etc. And that's really the asset that we're, we're talking about. So here we've neutralized the costs and risks 
But we do have to bear in mind that the client's not got rid of the management time they're going to have to spend on the case. So that's still an obstacle to them moving forward. And also, that green contingent asset is, is a nice to have, but it's, it's a possibility. It's contingent and it's in the future. So anything that's in the future and contingent isn't as exciting and, and real as having something today. So you can take this a step further and you can actually go, OK, well, what if we were to introduce a new bar here? which isn't the actual claim value, it's not our costs, it's an advance of funding that the clients could draw down right now against the value of that contingent asset. And again, our green bar has now got a little bit shorter still. And that's because we're no longer just shifting the risk of our costs and adverse costs, we're actually drawing down real cash today against the value of that asset. And so we're giving away more of that asset in the future but we've now got cold hard cash in our hands as a business which we can use for restructuring purposes where um, perhaps the asset is a, um, a litigation asset in a business that's struggling financially uh, and it might be the only thing that they've got that they could actually use to, to draw down funds on today it might be very difficult to get cash in any other way um, uh, it allows us to do what we need to do in terms of restructuring or growing the business, acquiring another business, investing in our own staff or IT or whatever it might be. But obviously having money today um, is very different than having the possibility of cash in the future. And bear in mind, this is non-recourse. So even if the claim loses, we don't pay that money back. So just in the same way as we had those negative multipliers going down south, um, and having a uh, detrimental effect on our accounts, any money we get in today does the exact opposite. It sits as profit because it's new money that's come into the business um, and there's nowhere else for it to go. So the same multipliers will, will act on that money just as they would on any negative risk, um, but obviously they're acting in a, in a positive fashion. So we see that blue bar now rising up out of the ground with that times five example multiplier applied to it. And given the time frame that a lot of key decision makers actually spend in businesses now, and it's not very long, you know, CEOs of, of days old might have spent 10, 15 years in their position. A typical um, time frame now might be three to five years, could even be shorter than that. So for anything that they can do today, they're going to add huge value to that or, or apply huge value to that in a way that they won't to some possibility of getting cash in the future, which they might not even be around to see the benefits of. On top of which, many businesses will view that their ability to turn that cash today into something is much more likely than the realisation of a possible asset in the future from success in the litigation. One of the, um, one of the things this also moves us on to is, OK, so what, why have I talked about that? So it, it's to understand the impact of litigation risk and costs on the balance sheet of your potential clients. And, and this works, obviously, in, in a different way with individuals. But as individuals, you know, we've, we've got opportunity costs, if you like, things that we can't do if we're spending money on litigation. Um, and there's a, there's a cost to us for that. There's a risk to us. And not having to carry that risk makes it a lot easier to pursue a dispute than if we're having to find huge amounts of cash to keep the thing going over the next year or two. Where we can take this model is, it's just an example um, and probably the key part of the example is the fact that you can shift the risk off the client's balance sheet rather than necessarily do advanced funding which is um, probably a little bit more esoteric and, and not as common but certainly shifting risk off a client's balance sheet is something that's absolutely doable using a variety of things such as retainers insurance third-party funding and what have you which we'll, we'll come on to as, as we, we talk further but one of the issues for clients is we can't even tell them what that grey bar and what that red bar would actually be in reality. All we can do is give them a kind of best guess of what it might be. So really, you know, their risk going in is something that's somewhat unknown. And that's why you'll often have in early meetings with clients questions such as, well, what is this going to cost? And I've put down here string theory um, because you've got to have a little joke in a presentation. It's very, very important, apparently. The, um, uh, what I would say is it's very difficult to answer the question, what will this cost? And it's why often solicitors end up talking about lengths of string and, um, you know, hard to say, difficult to guess what the other side might do and all the rest of it. So 
I always think it's understand what the client's really asking. What are they concerned about? Are they asking what this litigation project is going to cost? Or are they asking what's it going to cost them? What's the risk to them? And actually, that's something that you can answer very early on. And I've put Schrodinger's budget there for anyone who's a big fan of particle physics, and I assume that's all of you. Um, it's a budget that's both fixed and not fixed. So a budget can't really be fixed for litigation because we don't know what it's ultimately going to cost, but it can be fixed for a client. So if a client wants to proceed with a dispute, you could very early on in the process, give them a fixed price for doing the whole project. Because let's just say the project is going to cost 100 and the client is reluctant to begin a process that might ultimately end up costing them 100 of whatever that unit is. But if you could give them certainty now that the project's only gonna cost them 20, 25, 50, whatever it might be, they then can budget properly for that project and make a decision about whether they want to proceed with it. Now, obviously, the rest of that budget doesn't miraculously just disappear. What we're talking about is shifting those costs and risks to another party. So whether it's you guys on a form of retainer you're doing onto the balance sheet of a litigation funder or an after the event insurer, an own costs insurer. That's really what we're talking about here. So you can say to a client, well, look, we don't really know what the project is going to cost, but we could charge you a fixed fee of 20. 20 would be enough for us to do our initial pre-action phase, get an opinion from counsel on the merits of the case, perhaps do some work around the losses, maybe even get um, a brief expert's report around the losses to understand what the claim value might be worth. Maybe we need to do some asset tracing or investigation work on our opponent to see whether they're good for the money. But I can do all of that work for, for example, 20. And should you then want to proceed with the dispute further, we'll find funding and insurance solutions that take up the rest of that 100. So the other 80 will be dealt with by other people. So now from day one on your litigation, you've got absolute certainty about what this is going to cost you. And we can even give you some outline numbers about what the impact on your overall claim might be of shedding that 80 risk. So, you know, if we're transferring that 80 risk to insurers and to funders, this is what the impact will be overall and what you might get back from any claim in the future. So really all it's doing is, it's doing what you might do in any project for any business, which is giving them some certainty about what it might cost. And if they're bringing in a joint venture partner to help them with this project, to take on some of the costs and risks, seeing what impact that might have on their share of the profits if the project goes on to be successful. Um, and all of these things are non-recourse. So ultimately if the project itself is unsuccessful, it's not like they're going to be paying any of this money back. That's their JV partners, the insurers, the funders, that will have to write off their investment there. And I think it's really useful for clients to have that as an option presented to them quite early on in the process where they can actually choose to take certainty around their own costs and risks at the expense of writing down that contingent asset that we looked at earlier. Now, Obviously, a lot of this talk is about kind of obstacles to clients and, and what stops them from instructing uh, dispute resolution lawyers on, on their case. Well, it is cost and risk, time as well, but there's not much I can do about that, I'm afraid. Um, but bear in mind that ultimately, you know, when it comes to litigation funding, all litigation is funded one way or another. You know, is it the client on some kind of fixed commitment that we've talked about there or some open ended commitment that, that could end up being anything? Are we making use of some kind of insurance product? DNO cover or, or whatever that the client has, or potentially an after the event product uh, that you're implementing for the litigation itself. How are the barristers and solicitors being paid? Are they on a traditional hourly rate model or some form of fixed fee or a combination of a fixed fee and a discounted CFA or potentially even a full contingency fee, a DBA model? Um, or are we bringing in litigation funders to, to actually take on all of the risk of the litigation and, and fund everything? Well, you know. On most cases that do involve funders, it's actually rare for the funders to take on 100% of the risk. Typically, an ATE insurer will take on the adverse cost risk because it's much more cost effective for them to do so. And often the client will have already spent some money just to get the case to a point of funding. Um, for example, on counsel's opinion and you to do some pre-action work 
maybe scope out the other side and, and put a budget around what you think the whole case might cost. Um, but really, whatever we do around risk is usually reflected in what we're doing with rewards. So, you know, cost risk on a case has a price, I suppose, and that price is typically some share of any recoveries made at the end. And a big part of what David and I do at Anecto is really just look at the different ways that risk can be shifted. You know, what's the client trying to achieve? And what are the best ways for them to do that? What combination of retainers, funding and insurance allows them to achieve what they want to achieve whilst also allowing the solicitors to achieve what they want to achieve? And what kind of pricing is going to be associated with that? And what's the most cost effective way to do it? I mentioned earlier, this isn't all about law firms just taking on huge amounts of risk. I don't think that's sensible um, in, in any environment, certainly not the present one we all find ourselves in. You know, cash flow is really important to legal practices. Um, and obviously you don't want to take on the risk of not being paid anything if a case loses. So this is again about managing risk. It's not about taking zero risk because taking zero risk typically means getting zero reward as well. And it's very re easy to avoid risk in life. Just don't do anything. What we're talking about here is the best ways to manage risk and the best ways to keep risk to a minimum whilst maximizing potential rewards for clients and for law firms. And as I say, that's looking at different models around the retainer model, um, different, sorry, I should just mention there as well. I do hear one thing that comes up a lot around CFAs, DBAs, third party funding, which is about conflicts of interest. And I would say, yeah, absolutely. Of course, there are conflicts of interest around different retainer models. Um, clearly the biggest conflict of interest is the one on the hourly rate model, which is something we've all used for years, you know? The incentive there from a client's perspective is they just see that their legal team is motivated to spend as long on a case as is physically possible, rack up as many fees as possible, um, and that's the motivation for the lawyers. Now, whether that's true or not, that's certainly the perspective a lot of clients have, and it's one of the reasons why they're perhaps not picking up the phone or not engaging um, in litigation. Um, and even those that have perhaps been successful in litigation historically might be reticent to do so again for that exact reason of there's just no control over costs whatsoever. The commercial models where clients align their interests with the outcome under some kind of CFA, partial CFA, damages based agreement or a funded damages based agreement where the client engages with the law firm on a pure DBA. Um, but the law firm de-risks its position by using insurance and funding. So if you like, it's very similar to operating on a discounted CFA model. It just changes the upside into a contingency fee rather than something based around hourly rates. Um, and I think that's an important one to mention. I don't know, it, it might be on another slide in this talk. Um, <laughs> I did write these slides, but I can't remember what's on all of them now. The, um, uh, Typically, the only ways to grow a dispute resolution practice are you take on more clients, uh, you bill more hours and recover more of those fees, um, you get more people working on cases and, and doing more hours on those cases for, for longer. That is really the only right way to do it. Uh, it's all linked to the number of hours worked. I should just say the, the only model that that doesn't apply to is a kind of contingency fee DBA type model where it completely delinks that relationship between hours worked and money earned. And actually you can, you can change the nature of the practice there where you can grow much faster by successfully delivering results to your clients on a contingent fee basis where you're actually incentivized to get the best possible deal as soon as possible for your client, which obviously is, is more attractive from the law firm's point of view um, than just having to build more and more hours on things in order to grow the practice. So it is something to think about. And again, this isn't just about taking on pure risk in the form of contingency fees. It's about managing that. You know, the contingency fee model is very attractive from a reward basis, uh, but can be very, very risky. So it's how do you then manage that risk? Well, you can either ensure your whip so that you still recover that even if the case loses, or potentially fund some or all of your WIP. 
and certainly all the disbursement costs on a case. So you're choosing the level of risk that you take sitting behind that contingency fee, um, but also getting access to the rewards, which can be much more beneficial than simply allowing a litigation funder to do that. You know, in, in essence, the, the typical litigation funding uh, model is really a kind of DBA. You know, the client gives a share of their damages to the funder and the funder then pays the law firm to do the work on the case. This is just flipping that model around. So instead of the huge profits going to the litigation funder because they're engaging directly with the client, it's shifting that to one that's more equitable where the reward comes into the law firm and then the law firm splits that reward with whoever's backing them, whether it's funders or insurers or a combination of the two. But it's a much more equitable relationship and certainly aligns the interest of the law firm with that of the client much more closely. Um, and I mentioned here at the bottom, risk equals insurance, cash flow equals funding. I think it's important to separate those two things because often what we think about is litigation funding is just cash, expensive cash from third party litigation funders. Well, it can be, uh, but actually what you're doing there is you're, you're letting money carry lots and lots of risk. Whereas actually, you know, the risk on a case might well be something that can be insured. So you can insure adverse cost risk on a case, but you can do exactly the same thing with own cost risk on a case as well. Approach an insurer, ask them to take the risk of your costs on the case, not just your opponent's costs, at which point, cash flowing the claim well it might change the numbers a little bit you know do you need every penny of your hourly rate funded if you know that your whip is insured anyway and you're going to recover that even if the claim loses you might be able to take a much lower level of funding because you just need the bare minimum of cash flow to keep the claim going knowing that when it ends whether you win or lose you're going to get paid you know you get paid a lot if you're successful and if the claim fails you're getting paid from the insurance. So something to think about there, you know, how do you split out cash flow from risk? Third party funding. I think the best way to think of third party funding is a joint venture. You know, what you've got is a project that might be worth some money, but in order to be able to release that money, you need someone to come on board as a partner to share in the risks, um, take on the costs and the risks of actually pursuing this project. And, and typically funders, I mean, it varies quite a lot, to be honest, between different funders and different funding models, but it's not unusual for a funder to say, take 30% of any reward, which is why I described it as being similar to a DBA model from a client's perspective. Not always the best model for client and, and certainly not always the best model for the law firm. You know, any scenario where approaching funders and asking them for very, very expensive cash on very expensive terms, you know, you've got to think who's that really benefiting? Well. Primarily, it's going to be the funder. CFAs, you know, we'll all be familiar, I would have thought, with conditional fee agreements. Um, where I think people perhaps miss a trick on these is uh, it, they leave it purely to be linked to hours worked on the case. So what you can do with a CFA is put in there a kind of minimum amount for early settlement. So therefore, you are incentivized to settle something quickly because you're going to get paid your minimum fee even if the thing settles instantly. And that can help from a client's point of view that they know that you're now motivated to try and settle the case before you've done all the hours to earn that minimum fee because you're kind of in profit, if you like, up until that point in time. Um, also, one thing on CFAs is I think we all have very competitive hourly rates and, and our hourly rates are one of the things we keep a close eye on in order to attract clients and, and make sure they don't go to our competitors. But if you're offering very commercial hourly rates, are you basically offering a saving to your opponents on cases that you win? Because it may be that the court would actually allow a much higher cost recovery on an inter-parties basis than the one that you're able to agree with that client on a commercial basis. So have a think about, you know, any scenario where a client's going to pay you less than what you think the case might be worth from an hourly rate point of view, Consider whether it might be sensible to do that case on some kind of discounted CFA arrangement where the client gets the benefit of the lower hourly rate, but you agree that if the case is successful, they'll be liable for a higher hourly rate that you can then attempt to recover from your opponent. And you can even cap your client's exposure. 
without breaching the indemnity principle, you can cap your client's exposure at what you recover back from the other side. But of course, it does keep that link between hours worked and profitability. Uh, I think DBAs as well is something that even if you don't use an awful lot, can be a really useful marketing tool because it shows clients that that option might be available to them and that you're thinking differently and you're willing to align your interests with that of the client in the right scenario. Um, I mentioned before about managing that risk around DBAs. This is just explaining that in a bit more detail, but I'm not going to repeat it all here. But again, just to highlight that it really does break that link between the amount of hours you have to bill on something and what is actually profitable to your practice. Uh, most people are familiar with ATE insurance, but um, a deferred and contingent ATE policy is one that you pay upon successful conclusion of the claim. So one interesting way of thinking about it is it's a little bit like a swap. You know, your client has an obligation to pay your opponent's costs if the claim loses, and they're swapping that obligation to pay the opponent in the event of a loss, with an obligation to pay the insurer in the event of a win. And that's typically more attractive for two reasons. One, you're likely to pay a much lower, about, a lower amount to the insurer than you would to your opponent. And also, you're going to be in a much better financial position as a client, you would think, upon successful conclusion of your claim than on an unsuccessful conclusion of your claim. And then it's just a question of, well, do you pay anything up front for the insurance or is everything deferred and contingent? And what impact does that have on the overall price? And you can use that exact same product to ensure own costs as well. So whether that's risk that the solicitor is taking on their retainer, whether it's the client ensuring their own investment in the claim. So even if the claim loses, they get some or all of their investment in legal costs back. Or whether it's using that insurance to actually go out into the litigation funding market and using the fact that the risk is being taken by an insurer in order to get a much lower price for the funding itself. So it's a model that's been around for quite a while and is used regularly by some law firms, but I think still largely unknown to a lot of practitioners, which is unfortunate because it's one of the most cost effective ways of making things work. It can also be useful in insolvency disputes as well where you could actually use it to ensure the risk, which might allow creditors to fund the litigation if they know they get their money back, even if the claim loses. But it's a really useful tool. And you know, ATE insurance might typically cost, say 30% of the amount you're risking. Whereas if funding's costing three times money, 300%, you know, that's 10 times more expensive than insurance. And as I say, you can use that insurance to access litigation funding just on much more advantageous terms as well. So it's not about just using insurance and never having any funding. It's about finding the right mix of client investment, insurance, retainer, and funding to make the case work in the most cost-effective fashion possible, rather than just lining third-party funders' pockets uh, with some of the most expensive cash in the world. Security for costs is something where Insurance can be a really useful tool, you know, rather than having to lodge hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds at court to meet a security for cost requirement uh, using an ATE insurance policy. And there's some confusion in the market about whether or not this is something that can still be used post premium motor auctions and other judgments from a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely is. ATE insurance is a useful tool to meet security for costs. You can also beef up your ATE insurance by making it non cancelable non-avoidable. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you can even consider taking out a deed of indemnity. And typically they cost about 10% of the level of the deed. So, you know, rather than having to lodge, say, £500,000 at court, you might pay £50,000 for a deed of indemnity instead. So just getting towards the end now, conscious of time, um, who's actually making the decisions around how a case is going to be funded and insured and I mean funded in the broadest possible sense you know is the client funding it are you guys taking on risk is a third party funder coming on board who's involved in that discussion and what's their thinking because I think one of the most important things that we can try to do for our clients is put them in a position where they can actually make an informed choice about how best to proceed 
or not proceed with any dispute. And at the moment, I think, unfortunately, clients are just not being given the information to make those kinds of decisions. So what are their options? What are their options about how much they need to invest themselves and on what? What are their options around what they might potentially be able to insure at very low cost? And what are their options about additional funding or you know, working with their own law firm uh, on an innovative retainer model that allows them to manage risk better? But it's just about presenting the clients with choices so that they can decide whether or not to proceed with the dispute. And hopefully, if you get the choices right, it means that more of these cases can actually progress. And if you get your marketing right, it means you get more of these cases actually coming through the door in the first place. So, you know, if you're working in large law firms, are your corporate lawyers aware that these things even exist? Because they're the ones that are likely to be engaging with clients on a day-to-day -day basis and have the opportunity to either be promoting these things as opportunities for their clients or just telling clients, look, litigation is expensive, it's risky, it's probably not something you want to really consider. Um, so I think understand who it is that's actually engaging with the clients and what they're talking to clients about. You know, your professional referral networks, the accountants, the IFAs, are they aware that these things exist? Or are they just saying to clients, look, you know, there's not really any options for you here. It's really expensive to litigate or litigation funding is insanely expensive. It's not something you want to consider. You know, we're doing cases where the value of the claim 100, 200, 300,000 uh, pounds. And we're looking at different ways to make it work for everyone involved. Um, and that means looking at hourly rates, looking at retainers, looking at what can be insured, looking at what a client might need to contribute to get this off the ground. And then ultimately at the end, looking at what ha absolutely has to be funded um, and seeing whether you can make things work. Um, and ultimately, not every case will work. Not every case will, will work economically for, for clients or have the right merits for insurers or funders. But at least you've gone to the trouble of pulling that information together and presenting it to the client so they can make that informed choice about what to do. And you've obviously met your professional obligations at that point as well. Uh, investing in litigation, these are really anyone's questions you know whether it's the client or yourselves or a funder or an insurer these are the things that are going to be on their mind so how much are we actually being asked to invest and over what time is the case going to win if it does win what does winning look like financially and is the other side good for the money how you actually access these products does depend very much where you are in the process so you know have you even done a letter of claim at this point in time do you have counsel's opinion on merits? Is it necessary to get counsel's opinion on merits? Have you got anything that's looked at losses and how they've been calculated? Is the other side good for the money? It varies case to case. You know, we have cases where you know little more than the contract has been presented um, and the client's been able to get funding because it's quite clear um, that there's been uh, an issue. Uh, the client's on the right side of the law. Uh, it's not particularly high value. It's not huge risk. Uh, and people are willing to jump on board either with insurance or funding very, very early on in the process. More often than not, you'll find that uh, at least a letter of claim and a response, um, people will want to see that just to see, you know, what the other side's likely to be saying. Um, I think most of the time when people come to us to talk about funding and insurance, it is at the point where they're considering issuing a claim and the cost risk is obviously going to go up considerably at that point. Um, that's a sensible time to be looking at it, as is really any other points during the litigation, such as around disclosure when costs might be escalating, which is not helpful from a client's point of view. Once you start getting close to trial, within about six months of trial, it gets much, much harder um, to access funding and insurance. Well, actually, it gets a lot harder to access insurance at that point. And if you don't have insurance, you're probably going to find it very, very hard to get funding um, because otherwise, in essence, what the funder's doing is not just investing in the claim, but taking on that risk of the case losing and having to pay the adverse costs as well. Um, but do also consider that it can be something that's useful uh, post judgment as well. Um, just trying to wrap up now. So when can you be looking at these things? Well, I mean, certainly this is something that can be in marketing literature on your website and in the articles that you're writing. You know, clients are typically not going to choose their litigator based on who's the best litigator. 
And the reason for that is they have no clue. You know, who does? How is it possible to judge who's a good litigator or not a good litigator? You know, it's really, you know, their assumptions going to be that if they're meeting with you, if they're talking to you, then it's because you can do the job. Their concerns then at that point are going to be, well, what's this going to cost me? And what are my risks? So think about what you can put into your marketing literature that might just get people to think a bit differently about disputes and engage with you. You know, have the opportunity to have a conversation with them and see if you can help. Another time really to be thinking about it when people don't always is if clients are struggling to pay their bills, you know, is this a time where you might want to consider retainer funding insurance options rather than just chasing invoices, actually see if there's a solution there that's available to the clients and whether it's a cost effective one that could be implemented at that time. Um, it might also be something to consider if settlement is, uh, if offers are being put on the table, you know, what are our options here? Well, if the client's reluctant to spend more money on the dispute, and so is considering almost any settlement, can you provide them with the information that goes, okay, well, look, you don't want to spend any more on the case. This is what the settlement offer is at the moment. If you were to take funding, take insurance, and take this further, this is the kind of settlement you would need in the future to put yourself back in the same position net or a better position net once you've paid the funders, paid the insurers, success fees and everything else. Again, providing clients with the opportunity to make an informed choice about what they're doing. And I mentioned before, you know, post judgment, not very easy to get more money off clients when you've actually taken something all the way to trial and you've won. And then you have to explain to them, okay, now we're into a whole new phase about asset tracing and enforcement. Um, not nice for clients to have to dip their hand in their pocket another time at that stage. And they might want to either cash in their judgment or get somebody else to spend the money on that asset trace and enforcement process and obviously funding is a lot cheaper at that point in time as well um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is you know how are we actually paid as, as brokers for doing this work well brokers are typically paid by the funders and insurers upon successful conclusion of the claim so when the funders and insurers are paid the brokers are paid um, so from their point of view it's the best kind of marketing investment you know they're not paid spending anything until they've actually got money in the bank um, the reason we set up as a broker just coming up to eight years ago now is we didn't want to have a sweet spot and pretty much you have to if you're going to be a funder or insurer you have to have a certain type of case that you're just going to focus on or a size of case or whatever and we don't want to constantly be saying to clients look we can't help you with this but do come back to us with the next one um, and I'm sure we'll be able to help you with that we will look at any types of dispute at all and see what kind of opportunities or what kind of options are available in the market for that particular case we're not tied to any particular provider as i say we try and look at things very much in the round so i worked for a legal cost business for a number of years um, and in my mind looking at things like hourly rates and retainers is just as important as looking at the actual funding and insurance itself uh, so we do try to take a very rounded look at these things to make sure it's going to work from all angles um, what do we actually do well look a lot of people think brokers just know who the funders or who the insurers are in the market and that is part of the job, but not a massive part, to be honest with you, because everyone's got Google. You know, really, where our role sits is looking at what options might be available for the client so that they can consider what might be the way that they want to go. Then helping with actually looking at what's needed to be done on the case to get it to a point where you could legitimately get it underwritten. You know, where should the client be focusing their spend? Is it on counsel's opinion? Is it on asset tracing? Is it on forensic work around the losses? You know, what's going to be needed to get this case underwritten and how can that be done in the most cost effective fashion possible? Once you've gone out to market and quotes are starting to come back in, one of the big things we do at that stage is actually be able to compare those in a simple fashion for clients because different funders work in different ways and insurers too. You know, insurers will often base their prices over the phases of litigation. Funders, it'll often be over time or on what you recover. Some funders charge a price based on how much of the principal you've actually drawn down, a different interest rate on the funds that you've not drawn down, and then a percentage of the damages recovered as well. Well, what does that actually mean for a client in different settlement scenarios? What are they going to get? And being able to actually put all of these different models and different pricing structures into one simple, easily comparable document is really really important for clients and it allows you to actually inform the clients and again 
allow them to make an informed decision on what to do. We also help a lot when it comes to just giving feedback on how different funders and different insurers work and ultimately trying to get a deal over the line at the end as well if everyone's looking at taking a haircut. So just to summarise, costs and risks are probably the biggest obstacles to clients potentially considering litigation. Your ability to retract and retain those clients is obviously crucial to growing your business and providing cost effective solutions is certainly as important now as it has ever been. And as Ben mentioned right the way at the start, you know, we're always happy to just have a chat about different cases, different things, and see whether there's anything that could potentially be done for that client. And if you need something in writing, you go on your file, it just says you've explored the options, even if there wasn't anything available, at least you've got that, and hopefully we've done a decent job for you. And I appreciate that's five minutes over, but I think we started five minutes late. So I will now breathe. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Um, I have a, a question in which, uh, the, the only question we've had in on the Q&A thing, so please do continue adding them. Um, and obviously I was trying to think of some questions um, in the interim as well, which uh, slightly irritated me. The one question that has come in so far is exactly the first one that I'd written down as well, which is <laughs> um, essentially giving us, uh, can you just give, give us a feel of sort of the, the typical minimum value of a claim that it needs to have, uh, what sort of minimum merits, um, in order that it's going to attract um, alternative funding options and get, get litigation funders on board. I mean, I've had lots of people who hear lots of talk about saying there's not really any minimum value, but <laughs> realistically, there, there probably has to be um, to make it worth yeah, a lot of the effort. Absolutely. And it, in insolvency, it's different. So insolvency disputes, people can take assignment of certain types of insolvency disputes and run them directly, which means they'll carry the adverse cost risk themselves. And we've um, just this week had an offer on a claim that's worth £40,000. Um, and a fund is going to pick it up for very little up front, uh, I think a few hundred pounds up front, and then a 40% share of recoveries after costs on the end. So, you know, for an IP, that's a pretty good option because mm. it's very hard to make a £40,000 claim work on CFAs with ATE insurance when the other side's threatening security for costs. So it just allows them to extract some value from that claim. And it, often in an insolvency, there'll be a number of these type of claims that could essentially be pursued. And if you can get value from all of them, then great. On non-insolvency related things, um, it's, it's about the interaction between costs and likely recovery. So, you know, if the, the lower the budget, the lower the claim value. So there just has to be some headroom, some difference between what you think you're going to spend pursuing a claim and what you think you're likely to recover. Because what we're talking about is shifting risk. And when you shift risk, there has to be some element of reward to go with that. So, you know, if you're gonna spend 100 on a claim and the claim value is 90, well, you know, where's, where's the value, if you like, in, in doing that? You know, no one's, no one's getting anything from that. If, if you ask someone else to spend that 100 for you, you know, at best, they're going to get their costs back. Um, if you've got a claim where you think the cost budget is around a third of what the claim value is, that's probably a good starting point for looking at options. If you've got a claim where it's a, your budget is a tenth of what you think the claim value is, then you can do pretty much anything with it, whether it's DBAs, full third party funding or anything else. Um, but I think one to three is a kind of starting point. I think once you get narrower than one to three, you're into real headache territory of how do you make this work. And again, you know, we'll always look at stuff like that because ultimately we might have an idea about something you might be able to do with it. Um, and bear in mind, you know, the other side's gonna be in a similar boat. And I always think that, you know, whenever, whenever we're having these conversations with claimants about how do we work this, make this work economically, Someone in another room somewhere has got to have the same conversation about defending the claim as well and whether it's economic for them to do so and how are they going to do it and what are they willing to spend on it. So, you know, we've had cases where simply by getting an ATE product where it had a very, very low fixed fee if the claim settled in the first three months, that was enough for the client to be able to approach the other side and say, look, you know, we've been in pre-action forever. You never thought I was going to issue a claim. I've now secured an ATE product and I'm going to issue the claim. 
here's the details of my ATE policy, you know, redacted details of the policy. And that was enough to get the other side to go, okay, fine, you know, let's have a meeting next week and, and thrash something out here. Don't issue the claim. Um, but more often than not, you know, if you're defending something, you know, good advice to your client would be, well, look, don't, don't worry about this. You know, they're not going to issue. You. you know, this isn't, this isn't going to cost you anything. Don't worry about it. But if it looks like the other side's absolutely serious and is in a position to issue the claim, your advice might change quite quickly at that point, particularly on lower value stuff, where it's just, look, settle this for as little as you can, as quickly as you can, you know, get rid of it. You don't want to start spending money on me defending this claim for you. You know, it's going to get expensive quickly. So always bear in mind that that conversation has to happen on the other side of the fence as well. But yeah, I'd say that there just has to be a difference between costs and damages really to, to make something work. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> and also probably a bit more of an observation, but sort of adding to the um, towards the end, you were sort of talking about creative thinking about when funding can be used sort of later on in the case or at various stages. Um, and I had a scenario recently that I spoke to David about with a, a lender client who's got a, <clears throat> a stack of loans with shortfalls on them. Um, mm. And they basically want them reviewing, <clears throat> but they don't want to they don't want to pay for the ones that don't turn out to be claims effectively. Um, yeah. So that doesn't sound like an amazing instruction in terms of, I'd probably expect about 75% of those would end up being non-runners. Mm. Um, but David spoke to some of your um, funders um, and it was, it was just that bit of the exercise, the actual running of the litigation would be a different matter, but um, mm. he, he did manage to find a, a funder who was potentially interested in, um, in working with us on funding the initial review work. Um, obviously there's going to be a, a uh, fairly, uh, I'd imagine there'd be a fairly chunky uh, reward for them for investing at only the early stage and when three quarters of the work wouldn't go through. But, um, but that was that was just quite an interesting conversation to have just to, to just to realise that, um, that the funders will certainly think creatively about it. Yeah, they will. They will. And, um, and it can be something where, you know, you, you just, you know, firms, including your own, might be more willing to take on some of that contingent risk on looking at projects if you know what options are available to you once you get through that first phase you know if, if you could have a look at something and go well actually you know if we can get a third of these off the ground and we can charge x on that third i can afford to spend y doing this review process in order to get this thing off the ground because i'm, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a good number of these claims to move forward and if you can then look at well what funding insurance package might sit around that if you do need to litigate you can start to do the maths of, well, actually, is this viable long term? Is it worth us doing that review process? You know, it, 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 we need to know that we can actually run the claims afterwards and, and how that might work. So always happy to chat through stuff like that and just see, see what options might be available. And I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot and it's because I most definitely am. But most of this is just about giving people the information to just make an informed choice, whether it's you, whether it's your client, whether it's an insolvency practitioner, you know, but just having the information to decide what to do. And unfortunately, it just doesn't happen as often as I think it should in, in litigation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also from the, from the firm's point of view, you know, I mean, one, one of the points that um, comes up is, you know, if a funder's prepared to put their money where their mouth is, why wouldn't the firm be? But the obvious answer is, you know, how much contingent work do you want to have on your books at any one time? Do I want to do that review exercise on those lender cases where there's, a massive stack of them and we're going to have somebody working on it for the best parts of the month probably yeah. not for that um for the cases that run perhaps we do so sort of working together and coming up with a, a combination um is is is, is an option yeah um, absolutely a, a good question that i've had um emailed through uh, what happens um if the funder withdraws uh, part way through uh, so the funder at that point is is writing off their investment so it's not a particularly attractive thing for a funder to do you know it's like any joint venture you know you invest in a joint venture you pretty much have to see it through to the end otherwise you're just writing off your investment so it depends on the reasons why they're withdrawing obviously you know has the merits of the claim gone through the floor has the other side gone bust and so there's no point in continuing with the litigation of costs escalated through the roof and it's not economically viable anymore or has the funder just you know for whatever reason decided arbitrarily to withdraw from the litigation but it's another area where you know looking at the contracts you're entering into at the outset is really, really important. And it's something we're very conscious of and make sure that we, you know, flag things up to clients as well, which are unusual in funding agreements or, you know, we don't think are sensible uh, from a client, you know, to, to accept in a, in a funding contract. Um, 
but yeah, it, it would depend on the reasons, but you can't, you know, you can't withdraw as a funder and just say like reclaim your money. Um, it's non-recourse lending. So basically once you're in, and that's one of the problems with funding is, you know, once you're in, basically you're in, <laughs> you know, you've got to see the thing through to the bitter end. Otherwise you're not going to get anything back. So there's a follow on point from that then is what if, um, you know, what if the, the magic document turns up halfway through and the, and the merits of the claim significantly change, obviously mostly for the worst. Um, does that, what, what, what's likely to happen in that circumstance? Yeah. I mean, I say all litigation is funded ultimately. So, you know, these conversations, you know, if this happens on a case, what would your advice to your client be? You know, your claims, not what we thought it was, you know, it's not going to be that different, you know, just because somebody else is backing it doesn't really change that conversation. You know, your, your claims worthless. Let's stop. <laughs> Let's get out of this in as least a painful fashion as we possibly can. You know, that's the reality of litigation, isn't it? You know, um, if the client's been fraudulent and lied to secure funding and insurance, then that would be a different issue altogether. Um, mm. But, you know, if this is just one of those things where, you know, the litigation ain't what we thought it was going to be, something's changed, people's memories were wrong or whatever, well, you'll no doubt be saying to your client, look, you know, we've got a big problem here. We need to get out best we can, you know, maybe drop hands is the best we can do at the moment. And just one last question that's been emailed over. Um, has the cost of funding increased following the Davian money decision? I believe this is the one that effectively disapplied the arcing cap so that uh, funders were potentially on the hook for um, the full adverse costs, even if that exceeded the amount of their funding. Yeah, it's because so few judgments actually appear around funding and insurance, loads and loads of attention is given to each one of them. But the reality is that these kinds of judgments appear because they're weird, freakish circumstances normally that you wouldn't typically expect on a funded case. So that case was funded. So the, the, the client moved solicitors, I think moved from Rosenblatt's to Mishcon's about six months before trial, got funding at the same time, about six months before trial, couldn't get ATE insurance because it was too close to trial. Um, and gave an indemnity to the funder for the adverse cost risk, which turned out to not be worth very much at all, the indemnity that is, that the client provided. So you wouldn't ordinarily, you know, that's not your normal funded case. Typically, cases will be funded where there's an ATE product in place that protects the client and the funder from adverse cost risk. And there's another case recently, which Ethereum funded uh, against Lloyd's, I think it was, where they just didn't have enough insurance on it. Um, and, the insu and, and it ended up where I think they were facing like a 10 million pound adverse cost bill, having been unsuccessful in the litigation. So, you know, these things can happen. Um, I mean, that's very bad news for the funder in that scenario. Um, but, you know, they're just having to take it on the chin. It is what it is. In answer to your question, has it changed pricing? No, because funders don't fund things without ATE insurance, typically, and that's their protection. And if you've got a case that doesn't have ATE, you're typically not going to get funding. Great. Thank you for that. Um, see that we've gone past two o'clock. So um, and I think we've done with the questions that have been sent in. So uh, I want to thank you very much for that. Um, hope all the participants um, found it useful. I certainly did. Um, and um, yeah, but just pick up the phone. You've got the details there for Mark and for David. And um, they're always happy to have a chat. Um, look forward to seeing some of you at um, the next uh, sessions on the uh, regular webinars from Bristol Society. So thank you all and uh, cheerio. Thanks, Ben. All the best. Bye. Thank you.